It's Friday night. It's the preview show. It's the No Nay Never podcast. Hello and welcome to the preview show brought to you by the No Nay Never podcast. We just knew that you couldn't contain your excitement for another episode. So without any further delay, we'll bring you the results of our extensive research into this weekend's fixture, which will hopefully help you mitigate any gaps in your knowledge. Listeners, on behalf of Dave Stam and Roberts, I apologise for that very cheesy intro, but we did decide to have a little bit of fun and play on words because, of course, the whole footballing world is in the middle of the very serious coronavirus outbreak. So we're going to start this week's preview show with a little word from our regular panellist, Tom, who gave us his thoughts ahead of the suggestion that the rest of this year's Premier League fixtures may very well be played behind closed doors. So I just want to have a bit of a look at the, uh, the coronavirus uh, furore that's sweeping the globe at the minute potential impacts on uh, football both domestic and abroad uh, obviously I want to preface my thoughts by saying first of all I'm not a medical professional I'm not an expert in this field um, I've tried to keep informed and I'll try and present as informed an opinion as I can um, and of course the other the other thing to start with is that obviously the game of football is never going to be as important as people's lives and uh, anything that can be done puts people's lives and safety front and centre is something that we will have to do regardless of the impact on, on football in this country and abroad. So at the minute in England, um, it's it's business as usual. Um, the Premier League games for the weekend are still scheduled to go ahead. I understand Manchester City versus Arsenal has been postponed tonight because of coronavirus fears, but that seems to be a one-off and that seems to have been a decision taken due to those specific circumstances, not the general situation in the country. Um, obviously abroad it's a different story. A lot of the European games this weekend have either been, uh, sorry, this midweek have either been postponed or are being played behind closed doors. I think all of the Europa League away trips from Man United, um, Wolverhampton Wanderers, they're all going to be either cancelled or behind closed doors. Um, and uh, I think to me that probably it's a difficult situation because there's a lot of games to fit in in a small space of time, especially with the Euros in the summer. But um, from a fan's point of view, and of course, again, prefacing this with the, 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 the you know, that it's, it has to be the case that people's well-being and health is, is more important than, than going to a game of football. But the games just don't feel the same without spectators there. And to me, it's difficult to see a situation where we play the rest of this season out behind closed doors or we play even a month of the season with every game going ahead without supporters it's one thing for clubs like ours whose primary source of income isn't ticket money and gate receipts the primary source of income is um, tv money and of course in our situation we're not in danger of, of getting relegated anyway so it's not as if we need uh, you know the backing of our home crowd to, to to drive us over the line or anything like that so we can look at it from a slightly dispassionate and perhaps privileged position in that sense for teams who are who have more to play for or for teams who are struggling lower down the league um the financial implications are massive and the potential impact on on you know the home advantage if you want to call it that for the rest of the season is is really it could be really impactful as well so for me what i would personally like to see <clears throat> is to do something similar to what's been done in italy which is to to postpone all football for a certain amount of weeks until we know that the virus is contained and so we know that you know we're coming out the other side of it and that people's health and, and safety isn't in danger um how it's going to work in terms of where they're going to fit the fixtures in obviously it's really really difficult the european football is being postponed obviously italy are going to have to play two months worth of games in one month to me the only solution that seems to make sense is that we postpone the euros um either try and fit them in 
in perhaps in a winter break sort of scenario at the end of this year and uh and and have a, a longer break for the Premier League and other leagues around Europe. Either that or move them to, to next summer to the summer of twenty twenty one. And then once the the immediate danger of the virus is, is blown over, um then we can fit the remainder of this footballing season across the summer. Um the fact that the Euros are being played over a number of cities as opposed to all being held in one event, I think that probably makes it logistically easier to do that. Um and there's less to arrange less to cancel. Obviously it's not gonna be good for people who've booked hotels, flights, etc. But that unfortunately something's gonna have to give with our situation. I myself have got flights to go to Marseille at the end of April to watch uh, to watch Marseille. Um and you know touch and go whether that will happen. It's a pain and it'll be a real shame but as I say health and well being comes first. So for me that's what I would like to see happen. I would like to see English football take perhaps a bit more of a proactive stance than than some other countries have done. You've seen the situation escalate in Italy um, because it's it's a slightly delayed reaction to the spread of the virus. Uh, in an ideal world, that's what we'd do. We'd put the whole thing on pause for a month and then reassess at the end of that month. Do I think that will happen? Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, in the Premier League and perhaps the country at large at the minute, I think people are perhaps not taking this with the seriousness it deserves and I think economic considerations and uh, and convenience considerations are perhaps taking precedence over health considerations and hopefully it doesn't take a massive escalation for that to uh, for that to change hopefully um, as I say we can see sense we can be proactive we can be cautious and uh, and we can put something in place to, to make sure that this virus doesn't have a significant impact on the country. Oh, there we go. Corona, COVID-19. It's a very tricky situation. Um, Dave and I are recording the preview show. It's now Thursday evening. And as it stands, Dave, we are um, still looking at being, uh, well, business as usual in the Premier League. Well, we've had the official announcement now. It was about half an hour ago the Premier League had tweeted that matches were going to go ahead as normal, although there was the news um, also coming out of Manchester City uh, that uh, Benjamin Mendy um, was self-isolating. There was a family member who'd been taken ill um, and a suspicion that he may have got the virus. So um, whether that affects anything, I don't know. Yeah, it's, I think it's just one of these. Sean Dyche touched on it, didn't it, in his press conference, um, just to say that we all know where football sits in this and actually the health and well-being of everybody is far more important than a game of sport. Um, we'd all very much like the season to carry on as normal. I don't think any of us want to miss any live games, but if it comes to it, then we will do. The games we play behind closed doors. Um well, since since we've been away in previous shows, Dave, we, we I guess we, we've also got the small matter of the Tottenham game last weekend that we just need to dissect very briefly. Um, we've not had a chance to get a, a full podcast out yet, so we're going to talk about this in more depth on Tuesday. But um, I, I guess, what a fantastic first half of football. An incredible first half, yeah. We were really positive on the front foot from the uh, start. Uh, created a lot of chances that first half and slightly disappointed to be going into half time only one goal up. We should have been yeah. two and maybe three goals up. Um, and perhaps we just didn't take the chance we should have done. And we, you know, obviously, uh, Spurs made some changes, uh, uh, personnel changes, a couple of substitutions, slight change in the formation, and they looked a lot stronger for that first 10, 15 minutes of the second half. They obviously got the penalty. I don't think there was any doubt that it, it was a penalty. I think there was definitely uh, contact from Ben Mee and he wasn't complaining about that decision. Uh, but then equally, about five minutes later, we should have had a penalty at the other end. So um, one of those where you come out of the game and beforehand you might have thought a point was a reasonable result, even though Spurs haven't been on the best uh, run themselves. But that first half um, and the um, the penalty we didn't get, we were left ruined the fact that we only got a point and didn't get all three. Yeah, definitely. I think we all knew, like you say, going into half time that one goal wasn't going to be enough. Um, 
poor Ben Me. Um, you know, like I say, there's there's definitely no qualms from any of us. It was a cast iron penalty. I think we've seen a lot less than then given for me. It was VAR, non VAR, new penalty rules, new handball rules, and regardless of what the rules are now that you don't like, I don't think anybody um could argue that under the old rules or the new rules that was a penalty. Um I'm hugely frustrated though by the, the Chris Wood penalty at the other end, Dave. Like you say, it's not just that it wasn't given. But my God, just how VAR didn't look at it, it's beyond me. It frustrates me so much that all VAR seems to want to do is find the, the tiniest, tiniest of margins to disallow perfectly good goals. But when you actually need it to do its job and to pick up on mistakes like that, it's nowhere to be seen. Um, I, I, I haven't heard anything yet, but I was quite surprised at the boldness of Daisha's post-match interview when he came out quite brazenly and said that he'd seen the, uh, he thought that um, John Moss had had a very good game first half and then he'd seen the Spurs management staff in his ear at half time and suddenly he makes a very different set of decisions in the second half, which quite frankly suggests that a professional referee has been influenced by um, a manager and his team and I'm fully expecting Daisha to get fined for that, to be honest. Um, well, I, I can see where he's coming from. It was almost like a different man was refereeing the mm. uh, second half. The threshold, oh, right. the, the threshold <laughs> for the yellow cards was just totally different. There, there could have been uh, three or four Spurs players uh, having yellow cards in the first half. I think there was one, wasn't there, in, in the first 45 minutes. And then the second half, just the, the rules seem to have changed completely. I don't know whether it's maybe a fitness thing. The referee perhaps wanted a bit more of a, uh, a rest in the second half, and that's why he was uh, dishing out more yellow cards. But it was like a a totally different performance from I thought the, the, the first half you, you, you didn't really notice him I think other than no. the fact that perhaps it could have uh, been a little bit strict but if he's doing that in the first 45 minutes he needs to be consistent in the second 45 minutes we didn't see that at all yeah definitely um right let's have a look at um what we've got lined up for this week then Dave we've got obviously quiz questions to look at we've got a preview of the city game at the weekend we've got fantasy football um we're also going to ask Tom to come back in at the end of the show as well just to give us a bit of insight into um the rather well we're going to dip into drink water corner shall we say um so let's start with some quiz questions now you left us with quite a tricky question last preview show Dave um and it was of course since Sean Dyche took over as manager in 2012, which four teams have Burnley already chalked up three home Premier League wins against? Give us the answer, please. Uh, well, the correct answers in no particular order. Uh, well, actually, I'm lying. They're in alphabetical order. Uh, they were uh, Bournemouth, Everton, Leicester City and Southampton. Excellent. I found this really tough. Like I always, um, a little bit of um, backstage gossip for you guys. I, whenever we go off air after the, I don't see the quiz question until we we go, um, on on air. And I, there is an answer in our show notes, but I don't deliberately don't go to where the answer is because I want to try and guess myself. And I always, um, after we finish recording and we're still on the call, I always try and answer it and see if I'm right. And I got Bournemouth and Southampton, Bournemouth and Southampton quite quickly, um. Le Leicester I think I got after quite some prompting i.e. I'd eliminated most of the rest of the Premier League but Everton Dave was the one that really threw me um, were there any other number any other correct answers from any of our listeners at all? Uh, yeah, we had a few correct answers this week. We had uh, Bryn Jones was in touch with the uh, correct answer. He got all four, uh, as did John Robertson, uh, Rob Thomas again and also Peter Jones and we will of course have another question for you all at the end of this show Excellent. Opposition stats. Well, let's move on then. Let's let's not waste any further time because we do now have um, a game to play at the weekend, which will be carrying on as normal, not behind closed doors or not, you know, abandoned or delayed or anything else. So um, great stuff. Uh, we are, of course, playing Manchester City away. Not one of our most favourite fixtures in a season this Saturday 14th of March at a three o'clock kickoff. yay um, Dave why don't you kick off by telling us what's gone on since the last time we met uh, well we played the reverse fixture at Turf Moor at the start of December and if you recall the visitors were comfortable 4-1 winners on that day uh, that defeat left Burnley in 11th place we were on 18 points and uh, the win moved Manchester City up to second place, uh, above Leicester City on goal difference. 
Uh, at that stage, they were a mere eight points behind Liverpool. Uh, but three months on, City are still in second. Uh, but Liverpool are seemingly out of sight and Burnley, as we know, are currently in 10th position. Excellent. Um, so we are obviously away from home for this season. Why don't you let us give us the lowdown, essentially, on Manchester City's stadium and their capacity? Uh, well, yeah, it's not the happiest of hunting grounds for uh, for Burnley fans. The City of Manchester Stadium, uh, which is currently sponsored by Etihad Airlines, uh, it's Manchester City's current home. And the stadium has a capacity of just over 55,000 for domestic matches. It's slightly reduced. I think it's about 53,000 when they play in Europe. There must be some different regulations for that. Uh, and it's the sixth largest ground in the Premier League. Uh, City moved there from Main Road for the start of the 2003-04 season. Uh, and that was after the stadium had undergone a conversion. Prior to that, it had been purpose-built for the 2002 Commonwealth Games. Um, it appears that we've opted for an away ticket allocation of 1,500 for this game, um, and that has sold out. Yeah, that's not surprising. We do tend to sell out when we go to City. We're all obviously gluttons for punishment because it's, uh, yeah, it's a painful away day. Um, talk us through then the heaviest Burnley defeat at the Etihad, please. Uh, yeah, not a good one, this. Manchester City's biggest win on home soil against the Clarets was back in December 1968 when they hammered Harry Potts' youthful Burnley side 7-0 and that was in a first division match. Ouch. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, they've also had another win by a margin of six goals. That was a 6-0. Uh, plus another four by a margin of five goals and that includes two 5-0 defeats which were both last season. One was in the FA Cup and then also again in the league meeting. We played them twice last season at uh, the Etihad. Yeah, that's a depressing start. So why don't we look at something more positive? Why don't you tell us about what Burnley's biggest away win has been then? Yes, let's. On the flip side, Burnley have chalked up two away wins over Manchester City by a margin of three goals. Uh, the first of these was a 4-1 win, and that was in December 1958. And there was also a 5-2 win in March 1963. But I'll come on to that later. I'll be mentioning that again later during this preview show. Um, but I'm going to break with precedent here and say Ooh. that all... Mm, yeah, controversial. Um, and say that although the margin of victory was only by a single goal... Burnley's 2-1 win against Manchester City at Main Road back in May 1960 can probably safely be described as Burnley's biggest win as it sealed the league title for us. Oh, excellent. Yes, I will give you that one for sure. That is certainly the more significant win, even if it's not by the biggest goal margin, I would suggest. Um, what about Burnley's last win then away from home? Well, yeah, unlike last week when we did the preview show, we can't combine the answer to this question with last season's meeting, uh, which I've already mentioned. Uh, and that's because it's almost 47 years since Burnley won an away match at Manchester City. Uh, many match previews may not even mention it, as some record books don't consider it to be a competitive fixture. But silverware was up for grabs, as Burnley, who'd just been promoted as second division champions, took on Manchester City in the season's curtain raiser, the Charity Shield, and that was back in August 1973. City took part on account of them having won the Charity Shield the previous season, uh, and that was because the league champions Liverpool and the FA Cup winner Sunderland had both declined their invitations to take part. Uh, the match, which was played at Main Road, uh, as it wasn't until the following year that Wembley became the regular venue for the competition, finished 1-0 to the Clarets. And the only goal in that game came from Colin Waldron. He scored a header uh, from a floated free kick into the box from Frank Casper. Uh, but we have to go back even further for Burnley's last league win. That was almost 57 years ago in March 1963. Burnley won 5-2 on that occasion. That was one of the uh, times we've won by a three-goal margin. Uh, but since then, we've played 18 league and cup games. That's in excluding the Charity Shield. And Burnley have drawn six of those and lost 12. Wow, that was like an essay answer. That was gripping stuff, Dave. I'm very impressed. Um, OK, why don't we move on uh, and look at some head-to-head -head stats between the teams then? Yeah, we look at our uh, overall away record against Manchester City and it stands at played 51. Again, this is just for away games. Played 51, won 8. We've drawn 13 and lost 30. That gives us a win percentage of 15.7%. Um, and that is below our overall average away win percentage against the other teams uh, in the division this season. Uh, that stands at around 20% overall or about one win in five. So we are slightly down 
um, at Manchester City, not surprisingly, bearing in mind our recent record. Uh, when we look at top flight away matches only, uh, we've played 40 of those away from home at Manchester City. Uh, we've won seven, drawn 11, and we've lost 22, which is a win percentage of 17.5%. Um, in recent years, uh, we have managed a couple of dramatic draws in our first two Premier League meetings. Uh, firstly, there was a 3-3 draw. That was with a late equaliser from substitute Kevin McDonald. Uh, and that was actually our first top flight away point for over 33 years. That was in uh, 2009 when we played them. Uh, and then we also managed another draw. That was a 2-2 draw in December 2014. Uh, goals, second half goals from George Boyd and Ashley Barnes earned us a point after we were trailing 2-0 at half time. Uh, since then, the most recent three top flight meetings in the Premier League era have all been defeats. Um, and as we've uh, touched on already, there's also been a couple of FA Cup hammerings in between as well. Excellent stuff. Gosh, it's uh, it's always painful talking about the City games, isn't it? But, you know, there is there is a little bit of sunshine in there. Um, turning to the game at the weekend then, Dave, who is going to be the man in the middle? Who's our referee for the game? Oh, well, this is where the uh, the bad news comes in. Uh, oh. Craig Pawson has been a, a, a point as the referee for this match. Um, he was the video assistant referee for Burnley's home game against Spurs last Saturday, which we were talking about earlier, um, in which, of course, the second half challenge on Chris Wood in the Spurs penalty box didn't result in a penalty kick penalty kick being awarded. Um, however, he had no hesitation awarding an injury time spot kick to Wolves, if you may recall, earlier in the season, because he was the uh, referee for our visit to Molyneux back in August. Oh, God. Um, That's yeah, very much so. <laughs> so di different standards being uh, applied there, clearly. Um, yeah. Kevin Friend will be the VAR for, uh, for Saturday's game. God almighty. To be fair, though, just given the, the general poor standard of refereeing in the Premier League, I think every single week, we just, it doesn't matter which name gets pulled out, it's always hard work. Um, finally, then, in our new favourite feature for the second half of the season, who are Manchester City's celebrity fans? Celebrity fans! Uh, well, yeah, we've selected uh, just seven of Manchester City's famous fans, uh, which we've picked out to mention this week. And we've got uh, former Lancashire and England cricket legend Andrew Freddie Flintoff, uh, actor Craig Cash, who co-wrote and starred in the TV sitcom The Royal Family, amongst other things, uh, TV and radio broadcaster and presenter Susan Bookbinder, uh, the money-saving expert, that's Martin Lewis, uh, comedian Alan Carr, and of course, from the world of music, there's both Gallagher brothers, Noel and Liam. Yeah, I imagine there's probably quite a few City fans, isn't there? But we'll keep them, uh, we'll keep keep them limited. Um, finally, then, Dave, why don't you treat our listeners to some bonus footage, some ex added time, extra time features? Um, get delve into the the bank of Statman, Dave, and let us have your miscellaneous stat of the week. Statman Dave's Stat of the Week. Yeah, this week's Stat of the Week is one I tweeted out earlier in the week, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, in a remarkable coincidence, this Saturday's match is scheduled to take place exactly five years to the day since a very memorable win for Burnley over Manchester City. It was exactly five years ago, on the 14th of March 2015, that George Boyd scored the winning goal at Turf Moor as Sean Dyche masterminded a 1-0 victory over Manuel Pellegrini's reigning Premier League champions at Turf Moor. Wow, that is a good start. How weird. Obviously, it's... Uh, I mean, I, I, I found that there's, there's usually quite a lot of general similarity between seasons is that you tend to play the same teams around the same season I think the Premier League don't really mix up their fixed generator that often but yeah that is a that's a fantastic um fantastic stat um I guess moving away from your textbooks then Dave what's your what's your heart telling you about Saturday's game um it's going to be a tough one as we know we've we've uh had difficult times at Manchester City. We've mentioned those two draws, those, those first two seasons in the Premier League. We, uh, against the odds, we got the 3-3 three, three draw. Um, Owen Coyle's side in the first half of that season. That was our first mm. uh, away point. Um, and then also, again, against the odds, 2-0 down at half-time. I don't think many people expect us to come back from that and, um, and and get a point from that game. And that was a, a heartening performance in the second half there. But we have taken some real hammering since then. And we know that City are, 
uh, a really, really uh, tough side to play against, particularly um, at home. Um, it's going to be a really, really tough game on uh, on Saturday. And anything Burnley can get out of the game will be a bonus, I think. I think we've, we've, we've had other matches where perhaps we've we've not quite got there, not and then other ones where we've just been totally out of it. I mean, even even ones where we've been thrashed. I think the um, we had a, a game where Ashley Bar- a cup game wasn't it? Ashley Barnes scored in the first half, um, and then City came back and um, and scored a hatful in the second half. So we can't take anything for granted against Manchester City. And although I'd like to predict a, a win or a draw, I suspect it's going to end up as a defeat. Yeah, it's going to be made even more challenging by the fact that apparently we've no Jay's twisted his knee. Yes, which sounds worrying. Yeah, it's going to be uh, Vids and, and Woody up front, you would think, un- unless we go with five in midfield. Um, so at least it gives uh, Vidra a chance. I think he's, uh, he's he's done well when he's come into the side. So it's uh, an- another combination we've got from the start and we'll see how uh, how that pans yeah. out for us. He may, he very he, you know on the basis as well that our league position is pretty secure and we know that this is almost well it is a free game isn't it we're not expecting to get anything to me if he does want to at least for the first half um, go four five one and and keep, try and keep it relatively tight this is a very good opportunity for young Josh to come in Brownhill to come in and, and see how he plays um, and you know we can always take him off at half time and bring Matty on for the second half and see I mean I am a little bit worried about Woody to be honest because Woody's only just come back from injury and he's now going to have to play probably a full 90 minutes of the weekend against a very tough City side and and also this City side are absolutely ridiculous for just bringing you down. So if Woody's going to get fouled so much at the weekend, because that's all they do. If they, if you get a breakaway or you manage to string a couple of passes together, they just foul you. And Tactical take you down. fouls, it drives yeah. Me, yeah, yeah. drives me insane. And it really annoys me that these top sides do it and they don't get called anti-football. It's like, it's just, well, that oh, don't, don't even get me on my soapbox about that. Um well, I'm not going to ask you for a score prediction then, Dave, because I think you're going to give me a really depressing one. I'm going to say that Burnley are going to take the benefit of another side that are struggling for form like they did at the weekend, and I'm going to say it's going to be 1-1. I'm going to get a draw. I like your optimism. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, next, you'll be telling me to calm down. You did that last weekend, actually. The preview show for the Spurs game, you told me to, to not be excited, and look how well we played. And what did I what did I predict in the uh, preview show last week? Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got it spot on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, la 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 la. Not listening, not listening. Fantasy Premier League. Fantasy Premier League update. Let's move on. Um, why don't you tell us all about who our movers and shakers are in shakers? Shakers are in the much coveted, highly competitive, no near never Fantasy Premier League. Yeah, well, last week was another slightly odd one in the FPL. Uh, those managers who were relying on teams like Manchester City and Arsenal having two matches within the game week would have been disappointed when Wednesday's match was postponed. And also the absence of Kevin De Bruyne at the weekend would have disappointed the 45.9%, yeah, that's almost wow. half of all managers who have him in their squad. Uh, so that was a little bit of a surprise when he wasn't uh, in the team at the weekend. Um, but uh, despite that, uh, some managers were more fortunate than others, as missing players were replaced by auto substitutions, which is thing I hadn't realised happened at the start of the season. But if you select a player and they don't play, then it tries to uh, replace from the uh, bench, assuming they were uh, they were playing and, and not injured. Um, hey, it's not done that with mine. It, well, you, your players on the bench are injured. That's probably why. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can't catch a break with this fancy break. No. I'm so rubbish. I'm no. so rubbish. You did. You had a decent. Well, come on to it in a second. You had, you had a, a better week. Um, we haven't looked beyond the f- the top three positions for a while, uh, so I thought this week we'd uh, name check and do a countdown of the entire top ten. So, oh, excellent! Yes. Here goes. At uh, tenth position, we've got Phil Wilcock uh, with Deitch to see you. Uh, his team, uh, Dan Barnes, do or Deitch in ninth position. Then we've got Dale's Devils from Dale Warrington. That's eighth position. In seventh is Tom Mitchum with T T R R D. Uh, we still sixth, don't know what that stands for. We don't. We might find out one of these days. Um, sixth position, uh, moving up, uh, is Michael Freeman's Up the Clarets. 
Uh, non-mover at number five. I sound like um, uh, whoever does the uh, charts. Uh, yeah, you chart. do. I like it. In, in num- at number five. Pops. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, no mover, <laughs> non-mover at number five. Uh, Rob Greenwood <laughs> <laughs> with a spina colada. Uh, down, down one place at number four. Tall Paul and Tall Paul. Uh, non-mover at number three. <laughs> John Suckley. <laughs> <laughs> Professionalism's gone out the window now. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please do carry on, dear. <laughs> Third position, John Suckley is uh, J- Subculture FC. Uh, we've got a, a climber up to number two. That's Max Robinson's Game of Stones. Um, and still in uh, the number one position, uh, Bennett Howarth's Bar Humbug. Oh, that's a good uh, nice name check for all of our players there. Yes. I think it's pretty impressive at this stage of the season to be in the top ten still. I'm very impressed. Um, what about Team None and Ever? Um, well, George Poole had, uh, had gone into the lead last week, as you, if you remember, when we were talking about it. He'd overtaken Richard Steele, um, but it's uh, changed hands again. Uh, George Poole slipped back uh, a place in that league, um, and Richard Steele's gone back to the top. He's now the uh, overall leader among the No Near Never podcasters in our little mini league. Um, and there was a strong performance, as, as I hinted before, Natalie, for your Dingle Bells team. Uh, that Ooh. lifted you back out of the bottom three for the first time in a while. Yes. Um, for the time being, at least, anyway. Um, but I think you might have left your sprint for the top a little bit too late. Um, and I still have a 182-point cushion ahead of you from my 120th position. You, you have you have 182 points more than me. I have 182 points more than you, yes. How have you done that? Are you cheating? Well, no, I'm not doing very well myself, but... I'm doing a little bit better than you. Wow, the shade. I'm not doing very well myself, but I've got 182 points more than you. Okay, moving swiftly on. Let's talk about the dream team, please. (laughs) Don't talk about Uh, my performance. Yeah, well, there weren't any Burnley players in the game week 29 dream team, but the high scoring player for the week, who scored 19 points, was born in Burnley. Um, That's Leicester City's Harvey Barnes, who, of course, is the son of ex-Claret striker Paul Barnes, who played for Burnley in the late 1990s before he went to Huddersfield Town in a swap deal for Andy Payton. Oh, excellent. Good knowledge. Um, so what what do we think is going to, if we have, well, how, I guess, how do we think the current climate with COVID-19 is going to affect the fantasy football? Um, it's hard to tell, isn't it? I mean, we had the situation with the um, Arsenal and City game being uh, called off. Uh, we may see one-off um, postponements that might uh, might come into it. So, again, it may be last minute before that happens. We, we don't know. Um, games being behind closed doors seems to be the next step. That might be in a, a week or two. We're not too sure about that. Uh, but it certainly will test the merits of even the most experienced FPL managers. So there's bound to be plenty going on between now and May or whenever we uh, we, we finish the season, if, if we do uh, result in a a delay to, to matches with, with games having to be completed. Yeah, I just I can't I just can't see them cancelling the season. Um I think they'll play behind closed doors. I just there has to be um a level of respect for um the spirit of the competition. The integrity you know, of the like, competition, yeah, the, yeah. Integrity is the right word, not spirit. Um, you know, if if we just postpone the season now, what? So Norwich just get another free pass next year at the Premier League. And mm. what about as you know, as much as I don't have a massive amount of sympathy for, for Leeds, but Leeds and West Brom are, are pretty much sewn up promotion. So like, well, what if they that's their chance? What if next season they get injuries or they don't play as well and they miss out on their chance? They just I just think the ramifications of cancelling the season will be too much. Yeah, I, th- um, I think what's probably more likely is they'll defer um, Euro 2020 for a year and perhaps give clubs an opportunity to complete matches over yeah. the summer. That might be another option. Although saying that, with the news coming out of the press conference today that this delaying tactic is going to um, push our peak for the next 10 to 14 weeks, that puts us right in the middle of where Italy now are, in the middle of June. So, to me... It kind of feels like they're wanting to tie up some loose ends now, get football seasons finished, get schools out. I think, to me, that sounds why they're pushing everything through to the summer. But 
you know, I am no expert, so please don't take that. Um, we'll hopefully be back with another Fantasy Premier League update next week then, but obviously we're going to have to keep a very close eye on this with, as Dave says, the current uncertainty over fixtures. Um, we're going to do our utmost, though, to keep you informed on social media via Twitter and Facebook. So, um, yeah, let's just hope we get a few games in there so we can finally crown our champion. Um, before we move on to, to finish this week's podcast, um, just a little bit of news coming out from around the grounds. Um, <laughs> just because this has been a popular feature, so it's just one we want to bring back for a few listeners who enjoyed this. There's been a lot of press reports this week that our friend Danny Drinkwater is potentially having his loan deal at Villa cancelled due to a, a, a fight in training ways, allegedly. Um, this has not been proven yet and the club haven't made a comment um, headbutted a fellow player so um, <laughs> we just did um, a lot of us were kind of putting our hands up and going oh yeah sorry Gaffer you were probably right about this one um, but we asked Tom our good friend and panellist Tom Whitaker, to delve back into Drinkwater Corner to give his thoughts on that situation Hi all uh, it's Tom I'm ushering you back into Drinkwater Corner for possibly the final time uh, you remember last time we spoke about Danny, he just made his debut for Aston Villa. It didn't go very well, they were beaten 6-1 by Manchester City. Um, and it was at the point when a lot of Burnley fans had been quite perturbed that he left us early. Um, cut his loan short, there were, there were, a lot of the talk was that we'd got him fit and then packed him off to a relegation rival. Um, but a couple of months down the line, of course, things are looking very different. Um, they're certainly not a relegation arrival now, not of ours anyway. Uh, we're, we're safely in constant mid-table. And Villa, of course, still looking over their shoulders. The arrival of Drinkwater hasn't helped their league form. They're still in the bottom three, think second bottom as we're speaking. It's been shellacked 4-0 by Leicester on Monday night. Drinkwater didn't get on. And uh, the, the the big fallout today is that we've, we've seen that Danny Drinkwater has once again been involved in a, a physical altercation, shall we say. We had the infamous nightclub incident while he was at Burnley. And uh, the talk is now that he's headbutted one of his teammates in training and uh, it's possible that Villa are going to cut the loan short. Uh, the, the games that he has played for Villa, he's not been fit at all. He's looked miles off the pace. We've seen a lot of their fans criticising the decision to bring him in. He was brought in as a replacement for John McGinn. I mean, he's never been a goal scorer in midfielder, so that seemed like a strange choice to begin with. So Aston Villa's transfer policy does seem to have been a little bit scattergun. Um, they've chucked a lot of money at a lot of players and perhaps hoping to see what sticks from that. Um, I think it's fair to say that Drinkwater is, is not where it's out for them. Um, the talk in the podcast earlier this season was that we were hoping that uh, we were going to get him back on side, get him back fit. There was a lot of talk from our fans that perhaps Dyer should have been a bit premature letting him go. But I think anyone who was thinking that has got to hold their hands up and say that, that uh, Dyer quit his losses at the right time. Obviously, with hindsight, it was a mistake to bring him in in the first place. Um, but he's not he's not uh, got close to working his way back to fitness. And let's be honest, it doesn't look as though the attitude is there for, for him to really put that those hard yards in and, and get himself back to full fitness. For whatever reason, uh, you know, he's obviously got some demons that he's battling with off the pitch. And uh, I don't wish any ill on him. But at the same time, uh, I think anyone who was was quite pleased to see the back of him in January has been has been vindicated. I've seen uh, a couple of interesting comments from people suggesting that perhaps drink water and then Gibson later in the month leaving has has perhaps been a bit of a catalyst for our good form as well. Perhaps enhanced the uh, the team spirit off the pitch, brought the dressing room a little bit close together. Maybe there's some truth in that as well. All I can say is I'm very glad that he's not turning out in a burning shirt. Dave's quiz question. And finally, we finish this week's podcast with another quiz question. Dave, what are you going to set for our listeners this week? Okay, this week's quiz question is, uh, prior to this weekend's match, who was the last Burnley player to score a Premier League goal for Burnley at the City of Manchester Stadium? Hmm, I think that's probably a pretty easy one for most of our listeners. Um, why don't you tell our listeners how they submit their answers then, please, Dave? Uh, yeah, the best ways to get in touch with your answers are you can tweet us or send us a direct message on Twitter. That's at no Near Never. Uh, alternatively, you can email us podcast at no Near Never dot net 
or you can also reply to us as we'll put the post for this preview show on the No Nay Never Facebook page and we will reveal the correct answer at the start of our next preview show. Excellent. Well, that is everything that we have time for this week. It's been a bit of a, a longer preview show than normal just because we wanted to give our reaction to a few things that are going on at the moment. Um, well, let's just see what the world brings. Um, stay safe, everybody. Remember to wash your hands. Be careful socialising and shaking your hands with people and just basically just be safe, um, especially everybody who's travelling to the City of Manchester Stadium at the weekend. Just look out for each other, exercise some common sense and just look out for those people who are vulnerable to this virus and who are potentially going to be very, very poorly or, God forbid, worse if they were to contract it. So, yes, to you, you might just get a cold, you might just get the flu, you might just bounce back after a couple of days in self-isolation. But if you don't be cautious and you don't exercise some reasonable um, common sense, you could easily help spread this and infect people. We And, you know, we need to look after each other, not just in the Burnley family, but across the whole of the UK. So Godspeed to you all heading to, to Manchester at the weekend. Do enjoy it. We have been given um you know the advice of professionals that it is safe to go and that you can enjoy it so cheer the boys on bring those three points back my thanks as ever go to producer matt for editing this podcast and getting it out to us but my just all the love in the world to my um colleague here and the star of this pod show uh, this pod show that's not a word the star of the preview show which is a podcast i think i've merged the two together um our headliner dave roberts who just puts a ridiculous amount of work into this preview show and makes it exactly what it is um we will be back on tuesday with um the main show and we will keep you updated with everything that's going on and dave and i will be back um for the preview show next weekend um this has been the preview show brought to you by the non and ever podcast until next time <laughs>